has meant for razors is nothing but content. The thing is, as Jonathan Swift wrote in Gull Gulliver's Travels, that falsehood flies and the truth comes limping after it. It was a hyperbole three centuries ago, but it is a factual description of social media today. Uh, according to a series of studies that found that falsehood consistently dominates the truth on Twitter. Fake news and false, false rumors reach more people, penetrate deeper into the social network, and spread much faster than accurate news stories. To a similar degree, when YouTube autoplay uh, uh, lets video, uh, uh, the, the feature, yeah, it lets videos about vegetarianism lead to videos about veganism, and videos about jogging lead to videos about running mar ultra marathons, YouTube may be one of the most powerful radicalizing instruments of the 21st century. This is not because a bunch of YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter engineers are plotting to drive the world off a cliff. No. A more likely explanation has to do with the nexus of artificial intelligence and these internet companies' business models. For all their lofty rhetorics, they're advertising brokers, selling our attention and personal data to companies that will pay for it. Not to put too fine po a point on it, but all of this invalidates much of what we think about free speech, conceptually, legally, and ethically. <laughs> you know, John Stuart Mill's uh, notion that a marketplace of idea will elevate the truth is belied by the virality of fake news, of hate speech, of anti-Semitism on social media. By this point, I think we've, seen, we've already seen enough to recognize that the business model behind the big tech platform does not encourage the kind, of the kind of behavior that fosters democratic governance. This being said, the rules and incentive which underlie how attention and surveillance work on the internet need to change. And this is what we came to discuss here uh, today, together with Dr. Dror A. Dar, who is a publicist, culture and literature researcher, an op-ed and editor in Israel Ayom, one of Israel's leading newspapers, He's an expert with Hebrew and comparative literature and a musician. Dr. Eidal, I don't know if you know, but you can definitely applaud to him, is ambassador designated to Italy as a personal appointment by, the, uh, appointment by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. He won the Israeli two, uh, 2014 Abramovich Award for Media Criticism. He's a commentator, uh, yeah, commentator and publicist for Israel Hayom Daily Newspaper. Um, on his right, Yogev Karasenti, my ex-student, I have to say. He's the director for combating anti-Semitism at the Ministry of the Diaspora Affairs. And Dana Porat, the director of, uh, for, uh, of the Digital Department and com in the Communication Division at Yad Vashem. She was one of the founders of the Yad Vashem website back in 1998. Since then, Dana has over overseen the expanding Yad Vashem online presence, which now includes websites in eight languages, social media presence in Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, and YouTube. So, Yogev, we're going to start with you with your presentation. You are going to present now a very ambitious, yet controversial uh, project uh, that you've uh, worked on. I think this is something to uh, take a good look and a deep look at. Shalom and good evening, and uh, thank you, Dila, for uh, introducing us. Um, my name is Yogev Karasenti, and I'm the Director for Combating Antisemitism at the Ministry for Diaspora Affairs. Our mission at the Ministry is to ensure the thriving of the Jewish community worldwide, um, and to ensure their ability to maintain a strong connection, a legitimate connection uh, to the State of Israel um, and uh, to the Jewish identity. Uh, the struggle against anti-Semitism is critical to the ability of communities to thrive and to live a full Jewish life. 2018 opened with the horrific anti-Semitic murder of the Jewish-American student Blaise Bernstein by Atom Waffen member, uh, continued with the murder of uh, Mireille Knoll in her Paris apartment by her Muslim neighbor, and reached its miserable peak with the deadliest attack ever on Jewish community in the United States, the massacre of 11 Jews in the Tree of Life or the Simcha Synagogue uh, by white uh, supremacists. <clears throat> These events affect the fabric of Jewish life. They affect the willingness of Jews to identify as Jews and to attend synagogues and community centers. These events, which constitute the peak 
of the hatred campaign that is taking place against the Jewish people on part of various elements possessing completely different ideologies are happening due to continuing incitement and inspiration that extremist organization and individuals draw from, from each other, mainly online. It is not surprising that the Pittsburgh shooter chose to report his intention to his followers on social networks. And yet, until recently, the issue of online incitement has not been addressed properly. The result was lack of regulation and even a greater lack of enforcement. We, the Ministry of Diaspora Affairs, identified this gap, and hence we developed the ACMS, Anti-Semitism Cyber Monitoring System. The system, which is a unique development um, based on the Israeli startup, monitors in real time open discussion on social networks, no hacking, uh, in Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, in four languages, Hebrew, Arabic, German, French, French, and identifies anti-Semitic hate speech, categorizes it, indicates the level of incitement, user location, and produces a heat map of anti-Semitic incitement online. <clears throat> we use this heat map in the ministry to better plan our projects and allocate our resources. In order to avoid disagreements about the interpretation of, of what anti-Semitism is, we use the IRA, International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance um, definition, working definition for anti-Semitism, which was adopted by 31 countries and ratified by six governments, including the Israeli government. We turn <coughs> the definition of the IRA into an algorithm um, <clears throat> with a comprehensive uh, uh, anthology and use discourse analysis and machine learning in order to sift through the million of posts uh, in the internet. Some of the results you're about to see in the coming slides. So uh, this is the main user interface of the system and you can see that January through October we identify 1.87 million anti-Semitic posts. Okay, this only in the languages that we monitor. <clears throat> and in order to be considered uh, as an, as an, an anti-Semite user, it's not enough to tweet just once an anti-Semitic post. You have to repeat it. You have to tweet it several times and only with repetitive, then the person would be considered as uh, an anti-Semite and we would count him as uh, one of these uh, 197,000 unique users that posted anti-Semitic uh, uh, tweets uh, online. Now, 70, about 75% of the tweets were in English another 40% in French, 10% in Arabic, and the rest is in uh, German. Now, this tells us that laws work, because in, German, in, in Germany and in Austria, there are laws against incitement, and these laws against incitement reflect in less incitement online in the German language, <coughs> and this is something you don't have in, uh, <coughs> in America, due to the First Amendment, and of course, uh, in Western Europe, and you can see also a lot of anti-Semitic hate speech. <coughs> if we look at the geographic division, we can see it uh, again. Most of the anti-Semitic uh, hate speech comes from the United States. Uh, in English, it reflects both uh, extreme left, extreme right. Um, about 60% is what we consider new anti-Semitism, and the rest is uh, the other kinds of anti-Semitism. Um, the main trends that we identify is that anti-Semitic hate speech continues to grow, continues to be a source of tribulation, and it reflects and intensify, intensifies real-world events, like uh, I'm going to show uh, in the coming slides. Uh, new anti-Semitism in its various forms makes about 60% of all anti-Semitic incitement, and strong anti-Semites, mainly extreme right, left mainstream platforms like Twitter and Facebook, and went to less regulated platforms like VK, we contacted, and uh, yeah, I guess you know that. Um, <clears throat> the most popular anti-Semitic code words for 2018 were Synagogue of Satan, which is uh, uh, a book. Yoga, Yoga can I just, you, you mentioned on the previous slide new anti-Semitism? Yeah. W what does that mean by new anti-Semitism? Um, well, I'll, I'll, relate, I'll, uh, I'll explain that uh, in the coming slides, but uh, mainly, um, using Israel and the state of Israel uh, in places that once uh, anti-Semites used to, whatever they used to say about Jews, now they say about uh, the state of Israel. So, if you want to... Uh... Okay, so the most popular code words uh, were um, synagogue with Satan, uh, Kaik, no need to explain, Zion, which is a shortcut for uh, Zionist, 
Zog, Zionist Occupation Government, Coincidence, which is a coincidence that Jews are standing behind it, uh, the Going No, which is a, a plot that uh, uh, was exposed, and now uh, the Going No, uh, should uh, uh, Jews uh, are uh, troubled by that, the Going may uh, expose their plot, uh, Yupin, which is uh, the parallel to uh, uh, Kai, um, Sons of Dog and Pigs, mainly in Arabic, Shoananas, which is uh, mocking the Holocaust instead of saying Shoah, you say Shoananas, and then uh, it becomes uh, funny, it becomes something that uh, you can say, you can criticize, mainly in uh, France, um, expose the nose, and the echo, uh, the echo sign. What is the echo sign? The echo sign is uh, something that antisemites uh, use in order to mark someone on the internet as a Jew. They put his name in echo, and then they tell their fo uh, fellow um, anti-Semites that this person is a Jew. And this is something that uh, many uh, Jewish journalists actually uh, use in order to protest against it, and also mm -hmm. mark their names with the uh, with the echo sign. So uh, we see it in both mm -hmm. uh, both groups. There are only two hashtags. How come? What do you mean? Only two hashtags. Uh, because we took the words that have been, um, it's not only on Twitter, it's also on Facebook, on YouTube, and uh, uh, other uh, platforms. Um, here are some samples. Yes, uh, the most dangerous uh, trio for humanity, imperialism, Zionism, uh, Wahhabism, um, Jews complaining about the Holocaust, no one wants to hear. Um, again, Zionist occupying, uh, occupied government. This is uh, Shlomo's moral compass. You can see that uh, um, what he has in his compass is uh, communism, Zionism. Um, he's responsible for all kinds of uh, bad things. Shoananas, <coughs> um, instead of Arbit uh, Machfrei, uh, you can see um, the sign was changed to Shoananas, uh, keep calm and sing Shoananas, uh, uh, mocking the Holocaust, um, religion, the La Shoah, you cannot talk about the Shoah, it's like a religion, it's another way to criticize um, the discourse, um, Jews using the Shoah to make business, to make money, Shoah business, another uh, theme that we see. Uh, Gas the Jews. Hitler was right. <clears throat> and of course, conspiracy theories: the Jews are standing behind um, any anything that happened in the Arab world. But don't, not only that, Jews are also standing behind the mass migration from the Middle East to Europe, and they do that in order to mix the races in Europe, in order to uh, create a conflict between the Christians in Europe to uh, to the Muslims. Jews are standing behind another conspiracy theory is that Jews are trying to, to mix the races, to eliminate uh, the white race. Um, you see that uh, on the t-shirt of, uh, of the Jewish figure, you can see a, a mixed couple. And he asked, why uh, don't you have a black girlfriend yet? So this is another thing that uh, the racists are blaming the Jews for. Um, I chose here mainly uh, pictures, but uh, they write. Uh, as well. Now, if we want to, um, the main categories that we see in 2018 are new anti-Semitism um, stands for 60%, um, almost 30% classic anti-Semitism, and another 11% uh, of Holocaust denial and distortion, which is a category, by the way, that uh, the social uh, media uh, platforms in general consider as, as free speech and not something that should be um, deleted from the from the net. I in person believe that no one wakes up in the morning and decided to be and decides to be or to question uh, um, the gas chambers in the Holocaust or um, um, the ideology of uh, the Nazi party. I believe that all of this uh, Holocaust denial um, and some kind of and, uh, and questions about the Holocaust are happening or are manifested by uh, anti-Semites at least 99% uh, uh, of them. Um, we break each of these main categories into subcategories um, <clears throat> that allows us to know what kind of anti-Semitism comes from where in the world, if it's the uh, legitimation of Israel, uh, demonization, classic anti-Semitism, demonization of Jews, conspiracy theories, and with that we know uh, better how to uh, fit our policies. You can also see that we also monitor calls for violence when we see them, uh, either if it's general violence or specific uh, violence against Jews, against uh, Jewish communities. 
Another ability of the system is to um, break it by uh, cities. You can see that Paris is leading uh, for the last 28 days with uh, 1,400 uh, 1, uh, unique uh, anti-Semitic users that uh, um, wrote posts on the social networks. And this is no surprise, Paris is the home for the largest, largest Jewish community in Europe, but also to the largest Muslim community in Europe. And the clashes between these two communities um, generates um, um, such uh, a lot of hate speech uh, online. Um, second comes New York, Los Angeles, Washington, and um, the rest of the cities. Uh, you can also see that in Paris, the level of anti-Semitism, the toxicity of the post was the highest in the last 28 days. Okay, events um, online, as I said before, intensifies and reflects what's happening in the real world. Um, for example, this is the uh, Inter uh, International Holocaust Remembrance uh, Day, which is uh, um, on uh, the 27th of uh, January, and you can see that on the 27th of January there was a spike in the anti-Semitic discourse, and this discourse was mainly about denying the Holocaust, Holocaust distortion, Holocaust inversion, so if one wished to tackle these issues, that would be a good day um, to start it. And if you want to see where uh, in the world this uh, Holocaust distortion happens, then the system gives us the uh, uh, main locations. Same goes for the March of Return, um, the demonstration in the, uh, on the border, on the Gaza border. You can see that uh, it, start, it also reflects uh, a peak in the system. And here the main themes were demonization of Israel, the legitimation of Israel. So what happened in the real world, um, you can see it also um, in the system. <clears throat> Not the day and uh, the relocation of the American Embassy to Jerusalem um, also uh, <coughs> triggered um, an anti-Semitic discourse. Uh, again, the main uh, categories were demonization of Israel and delegitimation uh, of Israel. And we have a problem with these categories because um, we believe that they reflect anti-Semitism <coughs> and we are trying to convince the uh, media platform that um, this is anti-Semitism, and unfortunately, um, they are not always uh, uh, there agreeing with us. Another thing that you can see here is uh, concerning um, the Pittsburgh attack. Uh, you can see that uh, over the last five months, there was a rise in 50% in the amount of uh, multi antisemitic text from uh, uh, June to September of, uh, of the alt-right. And this is how it looks in the system, a rise from 4,000 um, to 6,000 uh, uh, white supremacism discourse online. Mainly due to uh, the uh, migration crisis. And then again, how it reflects uh, um, in the uh, white supremacism discourse in the United States around uh, October 27th, uh, where the shooting uh, took place, and then uh, it creates even more support for uh, the shooter. This is what uh, the shooter of the flowers published uh, on uh, Gab, uh, which is one of the less regulated uh, social networks, and <coughs> others uh, mimic him. They see him as a role model. Squirrel optics meaning I don't care how it looks. Uh, I'm going to do it uh, anyway. So we saw a rise in uh, such a uh, thing. Okay. Yeah. And it is important to remember that uh, such uh, incitement does not come only from the right, but also uh, from the left. You can see uh, uh, Lim Rao saying you brought this uh, on yourselves. And if I have to conclude, then I would say that online hate speech can be monitored and fought, unlike uh, what we heard in the past, that it cannot uh, be monitored and take too much uh, uh, manpower. We did that with an algorithm <coughs> and getting uh, quite a good result. Um, there's a strong connection between what's happening online and, uh, and the real world, and we need to find
find better balance uh, between freedom of speech and incitement, especially when it comes to new anti-Semitism, Holocaust denial, and Holocaust distortion. And in my, uh, in the ministry belief, in my belief, platforms should be held accountable for a uh, harboring hate. And I'm saying that especially um, on platforms like uh, Gab, VK, and uh, others. Um, thank you. In our previous conversation, you told me that there is an inflation in the use of, of um, um, in, 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 the, in the term anti-Semitism, and on the other hand, um, anti-Zionism is being hidden behind, um, um, uh, behind anti-Semitism. So give us your perspective. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. We live in, a, in an era where we, when we have to di differentiate between old anti-Semitism and a new. While the old anti-Semitism was defined by um, people, by the mob, we can say, or by religious claims, now we have a kind of, after the post-war World War II, we have a different anti-Semitism, which focus in, in the state of Israel. I can say in historical terms, focus in the return of the Jews to Zion. Because if you look at historical, When, let's say, let, let's talk about 18th century, when the Jews started moving back into history from a, a status of a half live, half dead people, and they wanted to, to, to live again as free citizens in their countries, in their states, in Europe, there uh, occurred a new phenomenon. The Jews left their uh, external signs, the beard, their clothes, their yarmulke, everything, but anti-Semitism uh, did not leave the arena, and uh, the opposite, uh, it enhanced. People think that I heard many times claiming how you, the Jews, you came here and you have lots of minorities, how you, how you treat them. But if we look at the Jews in Germany, for example, they wanted to be more German than the non-Jews German. They served in the army. They killed themselves there. They fought against their fellow Jews in, in the uh, army of Spain, of, of uh, France. They, uh, they were very patriot, patriotic, German patriot. They didn't understand how Jews with the uh, um, um, uh, Iron Cross were also sent to concentration camps. Here we have a different story. And it, it also connects to the new anti-Semitism. The new anti-Semitism, if I can define, is not criticism against Israel. If we dig deep into the claims, there is a deep opposition, rejection of the notion of the Jewish nationality, of the self, of the right of the Jews to self-determination as a nation. When the Jews in, for example, in Germany, in Germany, in the 19th century, when they wanted to to have a free 
uh, to be a free citizen there. One of the intellectuals there said that because the Jews are a nation, giving them a citizenship will um, uh, uh, build a nation within a nation, a Jewish nation within the German nation. And it, it, it was a problem for them. So after the disappointment of the, of the Jewish elite at the late 19th century from the integration of themselves in, in the European countries, they started thinking of coming back home, <coughs> means here, to the land of Israel. And then, when they started doing it, another claim jumped. No, you're not a nation. You are a religion. You're only a religion. And a religion does not deserve a country. The uh, 20th... Um, one of the a paragraph in the Palestinian National Charter, I think the number 20, says that the Jews are only a religion. And they belong to the country where they came from. They are not a nation, not a people. So, if we take and, and the most problem that we are facing now is not with the mob. It's not with, okay, I saw many of these uh, uh, examples. Okay, you're a Jew, you... This is not a real problem for us when we are talking in terms of cursing, of uh, saying bad words about the Jews. We can handle it. The biggest problem is to handle or to face the intellectual war against us. And this is not coming from the alt-right. In the alt-right you have the mob. It's coming from the left, from the liberals, from the intellectual elite that deep inside yourself they don't accept this idea of Jewish nationality that the Jews deserve to come back home and to establish their homeland here. They, in predisposition, they accept the position of the Arabs against us. Although most of their claims are lies. And I can, I can uh, uh, cope with that, if you want. But this is, this is a real problem, because when you have this position, intellectual position, it means that you are backing, unwillingly sometimes, all the attacks, not only against Israel, but against Jews. Because, I understand, because I understand that some people want to want to to differentiate between the state of Israel and the Jewish people. Our enemy do not differentiate between them. Perhaps um, maybe if I mention the name Alex Jones, it's going to wake you up Sorry. a little bit. You love him, right? Um, so Alex Jones has just been banned from YouTube, from Facebook, from Apple, and from Spotify. And uh, soon after, he was also banned from Twitter. So we can say that Alex Jones was kind of deplatformed, maybe. Uh, would that be a good uh, a good term? Um, his deplatforming is easy to celebrate. Uh, though some may wish that good speech is the best way to drive out bad speech, the harms he uh, perpetrated can't be dealt, I think, in the uh, within the marketplace of ideas. There's no. Um, reasoned uh, debate or enlightened com uh, compromise with the idea that, for instance, parents of children gunned down at Sandy Hook Elementary School in Connecticut 
were just actors in a false flag opera uh, operation later used to, uh, uh, to promote gun control. Nor is there anything to say about his claim that uh, KKK members are just Jewish actors <coughs> pretending to be Nazis. Lots of actors in this world, hey? Mm -hmm. um, yet, while I'm happy that Jones has lost his megaphone, I'm troubled both by the system that let him have it and the way it was taken away. Simply put, the influential, the influential digital platforms are built to generate more Jones, while also amassing worrisome amounts of centralized uh, power. But if the unaccountable manner in which the tech platforms can amplify harmful content has led to a crisis, so has the, uh, the, um, uh, the facility uh, with which they can eject it. Uh, Jones delivered eyeballs for many years. Then the platforms succumbed um, uh, to pressure and banned, it, uh, banned him, all within the span of a few weeks. Well, this is complicated stuff, and I want to... Um, uh, I, I put the the, uh, the different um, angles here, and then I'll refer to you, uh, uh, Dana. Uh, we're dealing with three ideas that are structurally in tension. That hate speech, <coughs> harassment, false accusation, Holocaust denial, and, and, and baseless uh, conspiracies cause real harm. That would be the first angle. The second one would be that free speech is a crucial value. And the third would be that it's necessary to deal with algorithmic amplification and attention gamers. Now you um, are heading the Yad Vashem digital uh, activities, uh, which is quite widespread. Um, you're doing a lot of educational work. Uh, you're dealing with what is being written on your Facebook wall. So can you elaborate a little bit on that for us? I'll be here first. How do I turn it on? So first of all, <coughs> for this opportunity to be here, um, actually, Tila, I'm going to relate to what you're saying, but I'm going to take a little bit of a different approach at the beginning. You mentioned at the beginning um, the power of the platforms, and I think we're all quite cognizant of the power of these platforms. Along with that are the possibilities, and these platforms present tremendous possibilities for us and that is to share uh, accurate information about the Holocaust, about the events of the Holocaust, in a way that is, depending on the platform and what we're doing, is informative and or experiential. So I'll backtrack just for a second to say that Yad Vashem has very comprehensive websites in eight languages. And part of our challenge, uh, I should mention, I'll mention what they are just so you know, English, Hebrew, French, Arabic, Farsi, Spanish, uh, German, and Russian. What about Chinese? Uh, actually, that's interesting that you mention that because there have been a couple of languages that we have uh, talked about, thought about doing. Um, there are, because for us, there are a lot of issues, um, language, content, especially when as multi-talented as my excellent staff is, don't really have a Chinese speaker yet. So there would be a lot of issues in creating content that we could stand behind in China, in Chinese. But it's a subject that definitely has come up because there's certainly a very large audience and I've spoken to a number of educators. Yad Vashem has educators that come from around the world and I've had the opportunity to speak to educators from China who have come and definitely there is a need for it, so I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned that. I can, I can answer something because I, I live in Hong Kong. Okay. So. <laughs> Later. Oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> so, part of our challenge, and I will tell you that it's an ongoing, it's a privilege, and I, I always feel like when I say this, it sounds a, a bit kitschy, which it does, but sometimes, you know, the truth is a little bit kitschy. It's um, an opportunity for us to be able to take. It's a challenge every day to take content, and we have a tremendous amount of content on the website in all kinds of different formats, and then to bring it into social media. And the idea for us is to try to take content that is relevant. It could be on this day in history. We 
we relate to hashtags, World Kindness Day, World Teachers Day, just about anything that we can find. It's to take content that we have and to make it into in a respectful way. And we are always mindful and respectful of the content, um, which sounds oh, a bit funny uh, sometimes, and it certainly was for us at the beginning when we first. So since Tila mentioned how long I've been at Yad Vashem, without revealing my age, you can get the idea that it's. A few years, so I was there when we went into into YouTube and when we started Facebook, etc. And each time, and going into each platform, now it seems obvious. But at the time, in, in, it wasn't obvious that Yad Vashem would be able to find a way to express what we wanted to express in all of these platforms. And each time, it was a conversation: um, Should we? Can we? How do we? And certainly, Twitter, which at the time was 140 <coughs> characters, was really a challenge. How are we respectful to the content and meaningful within 140 characters? Um, <clears throat> but there's this, our, our feeling very strong, is very strong when we see the rise in how many people follow us on Twitter and participate with us on Facebook uh, and Instagram and YouTube, et cetera. So there clearly is a need for people to know this. And we, our, our responsibility, and I, I think mission without, you know, sounding, uh, too grandiose, is really to share this content and to find ways to make it meaningful and respectful to as wide a global audience as possible. We have Twitter also in French, and we have it in German, and we have it in Spanish, and we just began uh, a Twitter channel in also Russian and obviously English. And we post in different languages, and we have YouTube channels, and the point of in all of these languages, <coughs> and the point is outreach. Uh, the objective here is outreach, and having said outreach, Yad Vashem, uh, in this past year launched an online course uh, about anti-Semitism from its origin to its present. A free online course, which is run already now in its second, um, second, uh, second round, thank you. Uh, it's had over 10,000 people who have joined the course from over, I think it's 150 countries, um, and have engaged in active dialogue after each lesson, uh, discussed with you know, all kinds of discussions. So the idea here of outreach and trying to find platforms in which we can effectively reach as many people as possible uh, on as many levels as possible is our ongoing uh, and daily challenge. I have to admit that I uh, was planning uh, to show you a work in, prog in progress that I'm working on um, uh, to create a co-regulatory model um, to monitor and regulate hate speech online. Um, together with the Ministry of uh, Diaspora Affairs and, uh, uh, and Yad Vashem. Um, but I want to... I want to speak to what you're saying now about regulation. What you spoke about earlier. Okay. Um, I, but I saw a few questions from the audience, and since uh, our time is really limited, perhaps we're going to take a few questions, and if we don't have time to show this model, then you'll have to come again. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh, I think I need a microphone. Um, actually, the question is for for you, Jogan. Um in, in the model that you have, is it possible to put in, let's say, a list of political candidates and to find out which have been exhibiting Holocaust denial or hate speech on social media, and uh, which would be useful, but that leads could lead to other scary things, um, which. You, you're nodding, so you understand what I'm saying. Perhaps I'm going to take some other questions. Mm -hmm. If anyone wants to ask Yogev about his model, let's just uh, collect some more questions. Yes. Wait. Yeah. <coughs> Hi, I'm Carol Benstein from the World Union of Jewish Students. Um, there is a, I, I had the Alex Jones debate with my 15-year-old brother, who's very into the internet. We had a very heated argument about it, um, and he, made a very good point that there is no due process to taking people off the internet. And my question to you is if there is, like there is obviously a very problematic balance between hate speech and freedom of speech and where do you find the balance, but is there being, is there research being done into what would be a, an appropriate due process to what you do and do not take down to make sure it's not flipped on people who are expressing rightful, logical, fair opinions, even if they're not fair, if they're not harmful to people, or if they're, like, how do you define harm? Is it just a call for go kill the Jews, or is it like saying all Jews are X, Y, Z, horrible people, and therefore 
draw your own conclusions and then people go out with and gun people down in Pittsburgh. Like, how do you decide what does and does not get taken down? So I'm also wondering, we, it's, it sounds like we have a practical way of monitoring anti-Semitism. There's a theoretical system that we can talk about in terms of how to establish what should and shouldn't be taken down and the rest of that. What I'm curious about is how the laws today, especially in terms of the European Union versus the United States, they're vastly different in terms of privacy and online, uh, impact what physically can be done, and then also, as a result, the kind of legal progress that needs to be made in order to actually implement any of these ideas in a real sense. Guys, those are questions to me, not to your game. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. That's no, that's the book. And that's it's also, it's like, I believe it's both. Uh, yes. It's tears off. Well, <laughs> Good evening. Hi, um, my name is Philip J. I represent Jewish Times Asia in Hong Kong. But my first question is to to Yog. Is it Yogi? Yogi. Yes. Yeah. I just want to know: Do you do you share your data? It's quite fascinating. Some of the some of the analytical things you found. Do you share your data to to other organisations around the world, to the police, to other? Yes, we share it with people. the organization, and if we see a specific call for violence, of course, we share it with uh, with the right authority at, uh, at that country. But uh, so, so the answer is yes, we share it um, with mainly with organizations because they're the one who have the capability to do something. We want people, we want communities to, to act upon uh, this information. Um, and of course, if I'm referring to the regulations, then the regulation and the all issue of uh, Cambridge Analytica and what uh, it did to, to Facebook made it much harder to monitor anti-Semitism online because as I mentioned we are not, uh, we are not hacking. Uh, we only uh, monitor what's, uh, what's in the open, um, what people put uh, uh, in the open for everyone to see. So it's becoming uh, harder and harder on the one hand. On the other hand, the platforms are doing much more today than they did uh, a year ago or two years ago. So uh, Twitter, Facebook are doing more than uh, uh, comparing to, to the past, but still there is a lot to do, especially with the categories that I mentioned. Um, and another thing which I mentioned is that we see, especially with the extreme right, that they move to other less uh, regulated platforms. And there is a big question, uh, especially with the new regulation, if someone in Europe, for example, is tweeting an anti-Semitic tweet, which, and this tweet is aimed at people in Israel, for example, what would you do? How would the GDPR uh, relate to that? Um, under what law uh, would you prevent him from tweeting that? Um, so the borders are, are not clear enough yet, and I think there is still the work uh, to be done on the laws and on the enforcement uh, of them uh, on the net. Anna, you wanted to say something about censorship. Um, I'm going to just mention a point that probably is not what anybody's expecting to hear, and that is that there is a certain amount of censorship that is very effective, and that's what we are feeling very much at Yad Vashem. What does that mean? It means that, as I mentioned, our you know objective all of the time is outreach and trying to use very the possibilities <coughs> of different platforms such as Facebook or Google and their possibilities to reach as broad an audience as possible. And we are very limited. We are currently having a, a campaign in Facebook to uh, help us to educate uh, against anti-Semitism, and we have been. Um, our ad has been, uh, 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 it's, well, it's pending approval, <coughs> disapproved, etc. but this is an ongoing battle. Uh, sometimes it could be we have a swastika in a video and it's pornographic content. It's, it could be a myriad of reasons that we're dealing with this ongoing. And we're working with Facebook. Um, not yet, uh, we haven't resolved it to, uh, to the, you know, to uh, our satisfaction, obviously, but for, we find that we are often actually very sensitive in our content. In Google AdWords, for example, currently we can't use the word Holocaust in a keyword. Now, in your Yad Vashem, if you cannot use the word Holocaust, it makes uh, the ability to find effective ways to say things in your ads so that you can reach more people. That's the objective. The objective is to reach as many people. And we are also, <laughs> we are also working currently uh, with Google to try to resolve that. So I'm, what I'm saying is 
and the regulation and everything is extremely important, but I'm giving you from a first-hand experience from the other side of the coin, we are really <coughs> doing it. Speaking of uh, sharing the data, first of all, most of the discourses about uh, anti-Semitism um, conclude in, in the topic of uh, Holocaust. Some of the leaders, I'm not talking about uh, the public opinion, but even leaders like uh, Obama, when he gave his speech in Cairo in 2009, he reaffirmed the notion that the state of Israel was established due to the Holocaust, the feeling of guilty of, of the nations, which means that we accept the claim of the Arabs that they were the victim of what the European did to us in Europe. But the truth is far from this. We did not establish our country. We did not come back to Zion. We did not come back to the land of Israel because of the Holocaust. We did it hundreds of years before. And we believed in it. The Holocaust had two uh, main uh, uh, lessons, if we, can, if we can learn from it. One is what we say all the time, never again. But the other, which in my newspaper, every Holocaust day, I have the uh, privilege to write the main uh, op-ed, and I repeat it again and again, Never again, it's good, but never again exile. This is the second lesson. So, so if we are talking about sharing the data, we need all of you guys, we need you to share the data with your readers, which means not to be afraid of the politically correctness and to give the data, for example, I don't know how, how much here, how many people here uh, 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 know about, for example, the memory, memory uh, uh, website. Memory website, 25 years old uh, website, very good one, gives translations of all the data that is spreading all over the Arab country into English, translating into English. So you can take from there and give it and, 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 and share it with your readers to understand that this is not a, a, a local problem. This is not only a problem a, of, of all anti-Semitism. And, and we have other a, a sources of data that we, we have to know. The only things talk about anti-Semitism in, 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 a, in a, a big scale uh, does not give the reader uh, uh, the amount of understanding of what, is, what, what, we, what we have in front of us to cope with. Thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to uh, really in, in one second uh, show you what we've been trying to do. Um, the model that we've created um, has two, uh, uh, two sides or two layers. One of them is, one of, of, of them is a material definition for uh, explaining what hate speech online on platforms means. And the other one is the procedure um, in which um, uh, the platforms should, uh, um, and, or should act uh, or according to which uh, the, the platforms should act once they come to decide what to do with um, uh, a speech which is a uh, hate speech. So what we've been trying to do is actually create sub-definitions for hate speech um, that, are, that are based on common criteria that is well accepted within, I would say, civilized Western countries. It's both America and the European Union. Um, and what this could be helpful with is the fact, um, or is, is due to the fact that we have created some kind of scales, um, and on, on, on those scales, each platform can actually choose where it wants its policy to be. 
therefore will be able first of all to have more transparency according to uh, community standards which are now are not which uh, accord, up until today are not comparable um, between the platforms and also uh, this could be used by countries in order to regulate there is a problem with regulating content on the internet because it might create islands of regulations uh, which are not going to be the same um, so this might be, as a, as a self-regulatory uh, measure, this could be, uh, 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 this could be helpful. And in, in terms of, um, of the implementation of the model, we're talking about a notification process, we're talking about how to make the decision, how to make the decision more, um, I'm, I'm, I'm running here really, but uh, uh, what kind of decisions can be made and how much transparent should the, um, uh, uh, the process be in order to create some kind of a due process that you have uh, mentioned before um, online. So we are out of time and I'm really sorry that I can't get into details about this uh, model which is still, we're working on it. Um, let me just uh, finish up uh, by saying, uh, or maybe um, to, to come full circle with a, with a quote with which I opened. Um, uh, it was Dickens, wasn't it? So it is up to us to decide whether we're all going direct to heaven or we're all going direct the other way. Thank you very much.